It was just about killing, killing, killing. No Miami gang is more violent. You might get your head blown for an ounce of coke. Or more brutal. There was a point where you could not bump into me without me hurling a blow. You couldn't look at me funny. They get pleasure in talking about how someone's mother watched their kid die. And how funny that is. They're proud of their Haitian heritage, but their cruelty has no limits. It talks to your loved ones to try to make your parents talk. And if violence doesn't work, they'll call on the dark power of voodoo. A lot of people has been taken out through black magic. They call themselves Zobound, Haitian to the bone. We won't let nobody come in our hood and take over Diddy going on no more. So pound man on everywhere, man. In the jungle, you gotta kill the eat. Miami. This South Florida city is famous for its Latin flavor, Art Deco buildings, and endless nightlife. It's also a U.S. gateway for narcotics traffic from South America and the Caribbean, with one of the highest crime rates in the nation. Since the 1980s, much of Miami's violence has centered in Little Haiti a poor neighborhood three miles north of downtown. I mean, it's not a neighborhood you would want to raise your child in. I mean, you know, every day you hear gunshots ring, people getting killed. This neighborhood is home to some 40,000 Haitian immigrants and has been overrun with drugs, gangs, and carnage. That's kind of like why they call Lil' Haiti, Lil' Vietnam. It's war out there, man. War out there for real. And it's all because n****s trying to eat. March 5th, 1997. The freighter Larche Dende, en route from Haiti, arrived in Miami and moored. A group of six gangsters hid near the pier. One of them was Makazo, a local rap artist well known in Miami's Haitian community. He was also known to be a leader of one of Miami's most feared gangs, Zo Pound. He's a little dude, he's about 5'8, but he's staying every bit of 6'7, six, 6'9. Six, it's his heart. Ain't nobody messing with Mac. In the dark hours of the night, Macazo and five other members of Zopound ambush the crew and force them to the back of the freighter. They brutally beat and rob the sailors. One man was pistol whipped into a bloody pulp. Robbing the ship's crew wasn't the gang's ultimate goal. Zopound's target was cargo they believed was hidden deep within the ship's hull. Better than robbing a bank. I ain't talking $2,000. We talking about units. If torture was necessary to get what we came to retrieve, we did what was ever necessary. Remember, we wasn't coming for, you know, a couple of thousand dollars worth of coke. We was coming for a couple of million. Zopound is a secretive gang known for this type of piracy, home invasions, torture, and murder. When they don't stop till the casket drop, it's like we don't stop hustling till we die, man. It's something that like we believe in. This Zopound member, Blind, has been in a gang since 1987. I had a shootout when I was 12 with some dudes in the projects. One dude took a radio from a homeboy baby at the time, and we got in a shootout. I remember that the first time I ever seen somebody shoot at somebody. Y'all just gonna have me walking through the hood. Blind moved to Miami in 1978 with his parents. As a new immigrant, he struggled to fit into American culture. 
my parents didn't speak the uh, speak the language. The culture was totally different. It was like it was like hard on me as a child, you know. Zobound gave Blind something he lacked: power. It's power and unity, you know. There's also power in secrecy. Zobound is mysterious by nature. Most members won't admit to being part of a gang and claim to be a movement promoting Haitian pride. Call it what you want. You know, everybody, it's just a form of identity. That's how they identify it as, whatever. But there's no truth to that. You know what I'm saying? They label us a gang for coming together for something positive, for a movement to help the people. I mean, I know where I stand. I know I'm not a part of no gang. 33-year-old Makazo is thought to be a leader in Zopound. He says that's only partly true. And I won't say Zopound has no leader because really all of us are leaders. We all are leaders in our own way. Makazo moved to Miami with his immigrant parents in 1976. Since he was 16, he's been in trouble with the law. Makazo has been charged with crimes ranging from drug possession to armed robbery and murder. Well, I mean, I had my brush in with the law, but, you know, I ain't no saint or nothing like that, but, you know, I'm just on another level. Local authorities say that the gang uses its code of secrecy to cover its illegal activities. If they feel like they've been investigated or looked at, they'll change their names. Not like you get in California, New York, where once you're part of this gang, you're in that gang for life. Their secret culture means even the gang members have conflicting stories about the meaning of Zopound's name. Kenny K, a Zopound member who grew up in Little Haiti, says it's about ethnic pride. The word Zo, you know, it was a slang in our hood for Haitians. Zo in Creole really mean bone. They were saying we had hard bones. You know that. So we took that, being proud to be Haitian. Jean is one of Zopound's founders and gives a more explicit definition. And excuse my vernacular, but if you're called Zo, then you're called the Haitian big Big, tough. You got Haitians with a pound of drugs, and that's how you got it. Zo Pound. Jean asked to have his identity concealed. The son of Haitian immigrants, he says he started Zo Pound in 1990. Unlike other members, he denies that it's anything other than a criminal organization. That was not no Haitian movement. It was a lake. We hit, we got the money, we got some guns, we had some drugs, we was off the chain. You want to call it a movement? What we did? We just was trying to get paid. Zopound developed a ruthless reputation over the years. Their specialty became a new form of piracy. Haitian ships were sometimes known to smuggle large quantities of Colombian narcotics, including cocaine and heroin, into Miami. Their gateway was the Miami River, a winding six-mile stretch that runs out of the Everglades, southeast through the city, into Biscayne Bay. The Port of Miami is at the mouth of the river. Its narrow inlets make it easy for smugglers to travel upstream and slip virtually unnoticed into any of the hundreds of private docks. These smugglers worked hard to conceal their shipments in order to stay a step ahead of U.S. Customs. They put it in the boat and well it and like that. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in cocaine. Some local Haitian dock workers were part of the smuggling rings and were willing to tip off Zopound for a price. You have the old Haitian man, old, we call him uh, the Haitian poppy. He tell you what's going on, he give you the format, you know, how to go on, how many people are on there. 
and even tell you specifically where it's at. You from Miami, you know, the boats come in, the boats getting robbed, they getting touched. That was a normal occurrence, I mean, on the, on the ports. The boats were easy marks, and the robberies were rarely reported. Who's going to call the police and say, well, I've been ripped off for, uh, you know, a ton of cocaine or a thousand pounds of cocaine? In the late 1990s, Miami police realized what was going on and began to crack down. They confiscated nearly 1,300 pounds of cocaine from one freighter alone. The increased police scrutiny made Zopound even more secretive and ruthlessly violent. One of the things with the boat invasions where they were killing the people on the boat so that there would be no, no witnesses. When Macazo and the other Zopound members raided the Larche Dende on the night of March 5th, 1997, they were hoping to hit the jackpot. The perfect robbery had one problem, though. The ship's captain was unaccounted for. Miami. Many call it the capital of Latin America and the Caribbean. Some 100,000 Haitians call the city home. Zopound, one of the city's most notorious gangs, was started by Haitian immigrants steeped in a culture of violence. There was no rules when we was dealing with there's no rules in war. These immigrants are refugees from the poverty, disease, and repression of their native country. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Some 80% of its people live below the poverty line. Barely half its population is literate. And the national AIDS rate is the highest in the West, up to 13% in some areas. People are victims of the social and economic injustice. Anyone who talked about Haiti and say, well, uh, they talk about the poverty that exists there. Miami's first Haitian immigrants fled in the 1970s to escape the murderous dictatorship of Francois Papadoc Duvalier. The refugees crowded onto old, unsafe boats and attempted to make the harrowing 700-mile trip from Haiti to South Florida. There were successive boatloads of refugees arriving here, fleeing the country, fleeing the, fleeing the brutality, fleeing the uncertainty, fleeing the political repression. Those who didn't drown or weren't turned back by the U.S. Coast Guard settled mainly in the Miami metro area. They ended up in low-income neighborhoods, including what would become Little Haiti. Out of all the uh, immigrants, I guess society pushed us to the lowest of the low. In the early 80s, most Haitian immigrants were unskilled laborers who had to work two or more jobs just to meet basic family needs. I mean, it was rough on them. Minimum wage, struggling to keep food on the table, pay rent, sometime behind on rent. You know, it was rough. I ain't had too much money, and we was living like in a little shack, you know what I'm saying? Red Eyes joined Zopound while in his early teens. As a child, he and his friends had trouble fitting in with other kids in the neighborhood. You know, the American kids, they was wearing jeans and the sneakers and the fly Jordans, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so when you're looking at that, you look, you know, you go to wanting that shit. The Haitians were often bullied by other children. They catch a vulnerable Haitian person that's walking to or from class or to or from school, and a mob of kids will jump on them for no reason at all. See, in those days, because of those things was happening to Haitians on Fridays, they call Haitian Fridays, they would jump to Haitians. John remembers one fight when he was 12. I was in the lunch line, and a kid decided to skip me. He was a bigger kid, so he kind of did me up really well. But I stood there, and I fought toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And um, 
I got hurled. I mean, I was called Haitian, stank, cat eater, everything under the sun. Jean and his friends realized they were tougher together than alone. In 1990, they formed Zopound. Zopound was created my 11th grade year because now you run the risk of you getting jumped. Those people put their minds together and formed a unit and said, we're not going to go down like that. We ain't finna let these people take over us and make us no slaves. You know what I'm saying? Zopound was the most powerful of many Haitian gangs that formed in Miami, all loosely organized around their neighborhoods. They called themselves cliques. Their goals were simple. Most of them, it was to get respect, to get respect and to get power and to get money. Money brings power also, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's what we was about, getting money. Zopound figured out a surefire way to get that money, selling narcotics. I sold crack all my life, ever since I was 11 years old. While the other young boy was trying to, in the park, playing football or baseball, I was on the streets getting money. The gang started to hang out on Northeast 56th Street and 1st. They dubbed their headquarters the White House. We right here in Lil' 80, 56 and 1st, in front of the legendary White House where we used to hustle. Like I used to tell you, you know, hustle. Sell a little weed, sell a little of anything we can get our hands on, you know what I'm saying? Let's see, what, you want to come find Zopound? Come to the White House. You got any problem with Zopound? Come to the White House. Anything that went place in Lil' Haiti before it went down, they had to come to the White House. Plain and simple. Believe that. We was young, fresh, swagged out. You know, we had our donks. Everybody with their candy paint. In Haiti, Francois Duvalier's dictatorship had ended with a violent overthrow. By 1990, the country was a democracy and had elected a president, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Then, in 1991, a military coup drove him out and a second wave of Haitian immigrants flooded Miami. Many didn't speak English and had to rely on their children to translate. The person that was doing your translating were the kids. And they only told their parents what they wanted to tell them. The children soon realized they were in control. Some joined Zopound, which was turning from a group of dealers and thieves into hardcore gangsters. We had muscle to do whatever we wanted to do in the hood. We was in uh, stealing cars and change the serial number, sell them. We didn't even rob banks, man. 94, 95 was when Zopound then became what you would call an official recognized gang of killers. John quit Zopound, convinced its primary goal was no longer to make money, but to commit murder. In his mind, the force behind the change wasn't rebellion, but the gang's deepening involvement in the drug trade. We went from the weed to mixing. At the time, we called it bulk. By 1997, Zopound had a favored method of getting drugs, pirating boats that smuggled Colombian cocaine. The Colombians started setting up a hub in Haiti because they saw an opportunity for, to get their drugs to the United States through uh, using these Haitian vessels. The Miami River, with its miles of winding waterways and numerous available docks, was a natural setting for the smugglers. It was easy. Come in, offload, and everybody's happy. It also offered easy pickings for Zopound. Crew members that fought the pirates were beaten, tortured, and sometimes killed. Oh, people lost ears and 
fingers and certain body parts, you know, to, to pertain the answers to what we needed to know. Zopound established a fierce reputation on the streets, even among the hardest gangsters. I have not found a group that's not afraid of them. Our, our Latin groups I tease with, why don't you set up shop back here and, and they'll look at me and they'll, are you nuts? Those Haitians will kill you. One Haitian gang, the Street Action Posse, or SAP, tried to challenge Zopound and paid a heavy price. Yeah, a little bird flew over to us and told us that they was gearing up to come kill us. And they came and got what they asked for. February 8th, 1996. SAP triggered its attack on Zopound. They planned a hit on the Zopounds, an ambush. Um, for some reason, the Zopound had gotten wind of this. Someone had tipped them off, and they laid an ambush waiting for the uh, SAP boys to show up. They had nothing better to do but try to with some who was doing some real who was getting some real money, and they wanted part of it. When SAP rolled into Zopound's neighborhood at North 56th Street and Miami Place, a fierce gunfight erupted. They done shot at some of my boys, but and we done retaliated and shot at them. 22-year-old Rubbington Roll was one of the SAP gangsters involved. He jumped out of the car to get a better position and met a hail of Zopound bullets. The driver stayed as long as he could, and he, he pulled it off while a dog was trying to go back in the car. You know, it was an ugly sight then, you know? And he died with his gun right there. He hit him by over 130 times, and there were about 200 shells out there. It turned to corned beef hash, man. Breakfast. The Sap Boys left Roll to die on the street. They just left him behind. Um, no one stayed around to render him aid. Miami police got a tip that one of Zopound's leaders, Makazo, may have been the trigger man who fired the fatal shots. One individual told me that it was, in fact, Makazo that actually uh, shot uh, Mr. Roll, as Mr. Roll was actually trying to flee. Um, but that was never confirmed. No one from Zopound, including Makazo, was ever charged in connection with Roll's death. The reason? They were a violent group, a violent um, gang, but nonetheless, in this particular instance, they um, were ambushed. Zopound remained firmly in control of Miami. It wasn't no problem, because we wiped that problem out as soon as it came up. Miami, 1996. Zopound, the most secretive and violent Haitian gang in the city, was operating out of its headquarters on 56th Street, or the 5-6. When well, you gotta come through 5-6, you had to put your window down to identify yourself. If not, your get shot up. And you couldn't ride around too times. Your shit to get shot the up. Zopound didn't care where they staged their shootouts or who might be killed. One notorious incident took place near a North Miami Beach swimming pool. Said there was like 67-year-olds getting swim lessons in the pool as rounds are going back and forth over their heads. And there was 60, I think 64 rounds left on the scene. Some members of Zopound publicly deny they are a gang, claiming police are unfairly branding them. They put the label on us as far as being a gang, but that's that's not what the movement was about. It was just about standing up for our people, making a way for our people. As part of its culture of secrecy, Zopound has a long history of shunning traditional gang behavior. We don't believe in throwing up no retarded gang signs. That's retarded. There are no beat-ins for new members or mandatory tattoos. 
it's not like, you know, with the crowns and the pitchforks and, and, and the bunnies and the champagne glasses. They don't do that. The only colors they fly are the colors of Haiti. We don't have no colors. A lot of my friends, they like to represent their Haitian flag, that represent their country. So this is what we represent. This is what all of it mean right here. This flag said right here, La Union Fet La Force, which means when you unite, when you click up, join up as one, that's powerful. Zopound says what holds the clique together is the special bond among its members. While some have more power than others, there is no one leader. As unity is family, it ain't no boss. Everybody their own boss. You feel me? It's like, you got something, you got something, you got something, I got something. To Zopound, putting in work is all that matters if you want to make a name for yourself. For the new people coming, you want to work, you want to work. Everybody want to hustle. Everybody wants some kind of income. But by you showing your loyalty and your dedication, make you step up the different ranks. Loyalty and dedication often translate to random violence. One of the gang's preferred methods of payback, drive-bys. They called it riding. Riding meant you go out to look for people to kill. And they just drove around till they found the people they wanted to kill. But if you shoot at me, I'm gonna shoot at you back. I ain't gonna come out there with no knife. Zopound drive-bys feature a barrage of shells designed to make a statement as much as to kill. All f day gunplay. And I just been seeing police come picking up shells of bullets. And, and not one bucket, not two buckets, but three filled buckets with none but shells. Everybody, including the driver, has a gun. Everybody has to shoot. Everybody has to empty their gun. That makes everybody just as guilty. The gang stocks a huge cache of automatic weapons, including choppers. And they say the chopper, because whatever comes in the way get chopped up. That gun is an epitome of power. It shoots a big round and, and does a lot of damage. That's the that's weapon of choice. Zopound doesn't always simply shoot their enemies or victims. Torturing them is often more effective. They have learned that violence controls people. If you're terrified of me, I'm going to get what I want, one way or the other. Zopound finds frightening new uses for common household items. People that was with me, whatever, they done plugged up the iron. You know, if you break, we will straighten you out. You know, get the irons heated up, and and they do some up. Man. They get people daughters, people kids, torture them, trying to make the mama talk, torture the mama, torture the daddy. They torture your loved ones to try to make the parents talk. Even a simple teaspoon can become a torture device. No, we have to no iron. We have to use a spoon or something. Put it on the stove or whatever. You get that hair smell first, and then you, you get that like a burnt meat, like you know, kind of smell. Trust me, man. I've seen killers, man, run out the room like man. I don't want no parts of that, man. You know. These gangsters have no fear of law enforcement. You gonna put me in jail? So what? Even the threat of the death penalty means nothing. And their mentality is, if I kill you, what can the state do to me? They can kill me. So once I've killed you, if I kill 14 more people, what can the state do to me? They can only kill me one time. Zopound does fear one thing, the mysterious power of voodoo. Voodoo, which originated in Africa, is practiced widely by Haitians. Voodoo is a religion and is a tradition, is a way of life, is a social life. The ways of voodoo often breed more violence. Yeah, 
They got people sell their soul to come up. One minute you see a mother bro, they sell their soul while they go to the witch doctor, to the voodoo lady, but they gotta bring a sacrifice, like bring a child or something and stuff like that. So you selling your soul and selling somebody else's soul for your soul. Many Zopound members believe it gives them protection during gang warfare. My friend was in the car and someone drove up on the car and shot the car like 10 times. And he showed me a, a little scratch and he said the bullet went through him, but the voodoo protected him. If you believe in something, if you go and commit a murder and you didn't get caught, it worked, didn't it? In your mind. The gang's members often consult priestesses of voodoo before committing their crimes. They'll tell them, I'm going to go kill somebody, and I need the spirits to protect me, and this is what I want. They'll sew them something together, or they'll draw them something, and they'll charge them $1,000, 2000 $3,000 for these items. And here it is. This will protect you. Police have seen the power of voodoo work in their favor. We were interviewing a, a young man for, for a homicide and he wouldn't confess, wouldn't talk to us. Um, mother came in, she was a practicing voodoo priestess. She came in with a big giant red ruby ring and they started rubbing it and they said a prayer and, uh, and she said, they cannot touch you, tell them what happened. And he went on to give us a full confession of, of the, uh, the homicide. Needless to say, he's in jail, he's been found guilty and it didn't work for him. In the end, Zopound respects the one thing they feel is more powerful than they are. I don't necessarily believe it, but he do. You know, so, you know, I don't f with the voodoo at all. Point blank, period. It's nothing to be played with whatsoever. Miami, Florida, 1997. Zopound, the city's most powerful and vicious Haitian gang, had developed a unique way of making money, robbing ships docked along the Miami River. Storming them, much like, uh, like pirates, although they came by land, but they, yeah, they, like pirates. And, and it was stuff that you would see out of a Chuck Norris movie, yeah. The freighters often carried millions in illegal drugs stashed in their hulls. Gangsters in Haiti would tip off their counterparts in Miami. So the tip, it'll come here. So all you need is the name of the boat. And then once it get here, then you got to wait the custom go on there and clear it. One boat, I know they hit for about 300 keys. Now with the big, big, big lid. The street value of these halls often ran into seven figures. Millions of dollars, man. It's my f man done. Like I say, you could wake up with five dollars in your pocket and go to sleep with two, three million, or maybe more. That's the kind of score Zopound was hoping for when it ambushed the freighter Larche Dende on March 5th. Six Zopound gangsters forced their way onto the ship. According to Kenny K, they were well prepared. A few of my friends politely invited themselves on the boat, and they had blow torches. Before turning blow torches on the ship's hull in search of hidden drugs, Zopound subdued the boat's crew, robbing and brutally beating them. In the chaos, the ship's captain jumped overboard. He swam to shore and quickly called the cops. The police came and a few of my guys got arrested, you know, had them on the news, you know, accused them of being pirates. The Miami police caught a big break that night. One of the men they arrested turned out to be one of Zopound's leaders, Makazo. He was caught as he was fleeing. He caught quite a few charges from the what stemmed on that boat invasion. Makazo was charged with burglary, armed robbery, and use of a deadly weapon. But even with Makazo in jail, the terror on the docks continued. These guys were violent. They won't give it anything up. The only thing that they would give you is a hot, you know, hot piece of steel from a gun. July 14th. 1997. 
pirates attack the transport ship Vanderpool Express at a Miami dock on Northwest 30th Avenue. Miami police found four crew members dead on the scene. A fifth man was found alive, blood gushing from his slashed throat. He died later at a hospital. Vanderpool Express was a very ugly homicide. Miami authorities immediately suspected Zopound, but there wasn't enough evidence to link the gang to the murders. There were also no witnesses. Zopound became even more brazen in its efforts to steal drugs. They started a spree of home invasions. We speculated the fact that the, the drugs came from the boats and it was dropped off to these stash houses and then that's when the home invasion robbery was being done. The gang would get tipped to homes where drugs and cash were being stashed. A Haitian gang member in Haiti would get information that a person was coming to the States with money. They would contact their contact in the American Haitian gang and they would set up a home invasion. They don't normally go into Joe Schmo's home. Most of their home invasions are not random. The targets are normally, been, you know, they've been staked out. This Zopound member remembers a long and uncomfortable stakeout. 48 hours straight in a car, pissing in, you know, the little getaway, um, gallon with them, pissing them out, man, just to get this money. It was just about killing, killing, killing. No Miami gang is more violent. You might get your head blown for an ounce of coke. Or more brutal. There was a point where you could not bump into me without me hurling a blow. You couldn't look at me funny. They get pleasure in talking about how someone's mother watched their kid die. And how funny that is. They're proud of their Haitian heritage, but their cruelty has no limits. It talks to your loved ones. It's how to make your parents talk. And if violence doesn't work, they'll call on the dark power of voodoo. A lot of people has been taken out through black magic. They call themselves Zopound, Haitian to the bone. We won't let nobody come in our hood and take over and they're going on no more. Zopound, man, on everywhere, man. In the jungle, you gotta kill the eat. Miami. This South Florida city is famous for its Latin flavor, Art Deco buildings, and endless nightlife. It's also a U.S. gateway for narcotics traffic from South America and the Caribbean, with one of the highest crime rates in the nation. Since the 1980s, much of Miami's violence has centered in Little Haiti a poor neighborhood three miles north of downtown. I mean, it's not a neighborhood you would want to raise your child in. I mean, you know, every day you hear gunshots rang, people getting killed. This neighborhood is home to some 40,000 Haitian immigrants and has been overrun with drugs, gangs, and carnage. That's kind of like why they call Lil Haiti Lil Vietnam. It's war out there, man. War out there for real. And it's all because is trying to eat. March 5th, 1997. The freighter Larche Dende, en route from Haiti, arrived in Miami and moored. A group of six gangsters hid near the pier. One of them was Makazo, a local rap artist well known in Miami's Haitian community. He was also known to be a leader of one of Miami's most feared gangs, Zo Pound. He's a little dude, he's about 5'8, but he's staying every bit of 6'7, six, 6'9. Six, it's his heart. Ain't nobody messing with Mac. In the dark hours of the night, Macazo and five other members of Zopound 
ambush the crew and force them to the back of the freighter. They brutally beat and rob the sailors. One man was pistol whipped into a bloody pulp. Robbing the ship's crew wasn't the gang's ultimate goal. Zopound's target was cargo they believed was hidden deep within the ship's hull. Better than robbing a bank. 